Hello Game Boys and Game Girls, I'm the Game Boy Guru and welcome to episode 5 of Cleaning Carts. And for those of you who haven't seen an episode yet in this series, I take a bunch of video game cartridges and open them up, clean them with rubbing alcohol, and also put my nice little end labels on some, such as Game Boy cartridges that are difficult to identify from the top or from the side. And so, uh, every time I do this, I also like to discuss some various topics, topics relating to retro gaming, game collecting, uh, and video games in general. So, let's get started with Tetris 2. And the first question that I want to ask, um, or, you know, first topic that I want to talk about, and that is the current trend that we are starting to see of falling prices for retro video games. Now, of course, in the modern game market, we already see the effect of falling game prices uh, because you have <clears throat> things like brand new PlayStation releases that uh, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, etc. games that come out at a 50 or usually $60 uh, retail game price. And within weeks, uh, not months or or a couple of years now, but within weeks, we're starting to see where prices for brand new games uh, of these types are falling rapidly. Um, for example, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn came out a couple of years ago, and within, even, despite how well the game reviewed and how um, how well lauded it was, within just a few weeks, the game had already seen a bit of a price drop. And you start to see that across the board now with almost everything. Um, <clears throat> new games are just, I think people are reaching the point where other than the dedicated fan base of something that will buy it day one, physical or digital, because they want to play it and get in on the experience first, you're starting to see a, more of a trend toward new games be uh, becoming less expensive very quickly to the point where it's almost not worth buying a game day one anymore unless it is an online game or something like that where you uh, you want to be part of the initial online community for that game. Uh, that makes sense in the case of something like a Call of Duty Black Ops or Halo or that kind of a thing where um, when, when you get into a game like that based on experiences with previous games, you know, there's always going to be changes of one sort or another. And so you want to be able to get in quickly and get your skill level up to a high level right away. So that makes sense for something like that. But for most everything else, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go out and purchase a brand new game on day one because prices are always going to come down and be prone to falling so quickly like that. Um, so with that, we've started to see a trend that uh, a trend where prices for retro games are starting to fall. And I'll qualify that by saying that <clears throat> right now it is primarily the more common titles. Um, up next is Who Framed a Roger Rabbit. Uh, you're starting to see prices come down for more common titles. Um, you're not likely to see a Little Samson cart for NES, for example, or uh, Crusader of Senti on the Sega Genesis. Um, drastically reduced in price although we have started to see those games start to come down a little bit just because other than the handful of people that felt like they had to have them and they had to buy them while they were able to afford them a lot of those even those more expensive games we're starting to see them come down in price a little bit 
Uh, not a ton, but uh, they're starting to come down. But more common games, things that you can find in almost every used video game store or where on any given day you'll go on eBay and there'll be 40, 50 copies of them listed, those things are starting to come down in price. <clears throat> and uh, those games have begun to, I guess, I, I'm not going to say devalue, but certainly the price that people are willing to pay for those kinds of games is going down because hardcore collectors typically already have those things because a lot of those games, <clears throat> pardon me, a lot of those games have, have uh, only gone up in price over the last, say, five to eight years because there was a boom in the market. But uh, a lot of those games, hardcore collectors who've been in the scene for a while have either owned or purchased when they were still cheap uh, back when NES, Genesis, Super NES games, etc. were selling for between two and five dollars for loose carts for almost anything. Uh, you know, there are always a few exceptions, games that are actually rare, legitimately rare, and <clears throat> um, don't, you know, don't, you don't see them frequently enough to where you can, where you can safely say that they are uh, widely available. <clears throat> Outside of those few exceptions, though, a lot of the more common stuff you're starting to see uh, come down in price. Now, uh, there are certain publishers that I think their games will always hold a certain value and primarily I'm thinking of Nintendo here um, or uh, some of the la later stuff by Taito for example uh, on NES and uh, things of that nature some of those things are always going to hold more value certain properties are always going to hold more value because of the, just the nature of what they are um, you know I don't ever see I don't ever see a time when uh, Sega Genesis Shining Force cart or a Thunder Force 4 uh, not Thunder Force 4 um, Fantasy Star 4 is going to be $5 again now there are exceptions of course if you stumble across one at Goodwill but you're not going to walk into a used game store and see those things for next to nothing <clears throat> again uh, unless the market crashes and the used video game store becomes a thing of the past and we see that market being picked up by comic book shops toy stores and secondhand stores in a way that helps to cover the uh, the core audience to some extent, but isn't dedicating their business model to that particular segment. <clears throat> and up next is Tesseray. Now, stating all of this, um, I guess my, my question that I want to ask in relation to this is, do we think this trend is going to continue? Uh, do we think that retro game prices are going to continue to fall for more common titles and for things that are not highly sought after? Or do we think that those uh, falling prices, etc., are going to plateau relatively quickly and that we're not going to see that much of a change in the market from where it is now? And I guess... <clears throat> I would like to think, the optimist in me, would say that I think we will continue to see falling prices. I don't know how drastically. I, I don't think we're ever going to get back to the point where Super Mario Bros. 3 is $5 no matter where you go. Or that Rad Racer on the NES is going to be a $3 game again. I, I don't think we're going to reach that point. Having said that, I, I do think that 
as many avenues as people have to play these games now, be it officially through things like the Nintendo Switch Online for something like Super Mario Bros. 3 or Metroid or a game like that. That, uh, and then also illegitimate means like downloading ROMs off the internet and throwing them on a Raspberry Pi or some other emulation means. I think between legitimate and illegitimate ways of doing it, there, <clears throat> there are so many different ways and means for people to access these, uh, these games and this medium that the prices can't hold forever. Uh, the demand for these kinds of games has to cool organically over time because there's only so many people in the generation of gamers who grew up with these things that will, are going to want to continue to pay the kinds of prices that people are asking for these games. Uh, because at the end of the day, collectors like myself, you know, I'm a cheapskate for a reason. Uh, <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but it's true. I mean, I I'm very frugal, or I try to be very frugal with my used game purchases as much as I can. Uh, you know, there's always time. There are always times when I'm gonna spend more money on something just because I really want it. But I think as as the market continues to slow down because so many people already have most of the games that they want and either aren't going for full collections or are only going for the handful of games they had as a kid so that they can relive those memories and play those games again, you're going to start to find that a lot of those common titles that people naturally go toward um, and start to collect, most people who already want those things have those things or they have some other way to play those things. So people aren't going to be willing to pay that much money for them anymore. Um, you know, there are still people who are always going to be willing to pay 30 or $35 for a copy of Contra on the NES, but that's not going to be everyone. And it's not a sustainable business model for game stores to continue to keep five copies of Contra in stock at $35 when they may be able to sell all of those in a short time by slashing the price. Uh, 30% and selling them for say $20 or $25 or even $15 um, because it's so common. Up next is Super Battle Tank. So it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to think about because there are there are so many variables. And of course supply and demand is always a constant within the market like that and as as the supply uh, starts to dip due to more and more people having purchased these games that could drive the price up because people know that there are fewer copies out there in circulation at the same time if the reason that the demand has cooled is because most people already have what they want and they don't need a copy then the shorter supply isn't really going to matter that much because there are going to be far fewer people actively pursuing these things in the first place so from that standpoint you're already going to start to see a hopefully a drop in prices because of the shift in the, the market. Now, <clears throat> the pessimist in me looks at that situation and goes, yeah, but prices can't fall too much because retro gaming as a way of life and as a business has been seen over the past decade plus as a growth industry and a sustainable model. You started to see all sorts of cottage industries pop up around 
uh, nostalgia and retro gaming. You've got people selling perler bead creations of pixel art. You have people making repro copies of more rare games so that people can have a physical cartridge to play on their system. Uh, you know, it's all fine and dandy to have an EverDrive or a flash card of some kind, but sometimes people want a real hunk of plastic with a circuit board in it that has one game that they can pull off the shelf and throw in their console. Why spend uh, 80 or or $100 on an EverDrive when you have three games that you want that you can buy from a Chinese repro place for, say, 10 or $15 a piece off eBay or AliExpress or a place like that. And so there comes a point at which buying an EverDrive or a flash card or something like that gives you diminishing returns. Now for someone who wants access to a whole library, that's that makes good sense. And it's a whole lot more cost effective than going the repro cart route. But for people who are just in it for the nostalgia of a handful of games they had as a kid, and yeah, that one or two games I had as a kid that are now expensive, but I want to play them again, you know, a 10, 15, 20 dollar repro makes a whole lot more sense than a 90 dollar flash card. Up next is Super RC Pro Am. <clears throat> but uh, with all the cottage industries that have popped up, uh, and also the small businesses that have started to do other cool things related to that like selling uh, ROM hacks pressed uh, you know made into cartridges or things like fan translations and that sort of thing I mean I own some of that stuff uh, ROM hacks or I own legitimately licensed things like I've shown on videos before you know over here on the shelf I've got my holy diver uh, collector edition set from uh, from um, Retrobit and I've got their uh, their version of uh, Super R-Type and R-Type 3 that came out and once Metal Storm uh, actually goes up for pre-order um, assuming I didn't miss the email on that already I'm gonna be pre-ordering that and probably purchasing that uh, you know, I've, I've shown off in previous videos a couple of things from Flashback Entertainment that I got. A couple of Metroid ROM hacks that they made full uh, boxes and things like that for. I've got uh, Lizard over here on my shelf of NES games, which is a new NES game that was done uh, within the last uh, three or four years and was made into a cartridge with full box and instruction manual and all of that. And so these kinds of things... Um, these things exist and these things have cropped up because there's a continuing demand for this kind of a, a product but at the same time uh, these are new products either based on existing properties or uh, entirely new properties and are just new experiences that people can get that still sort of mirror the old experiences so with all of the cottage industry popping up around retro gaming, I don't see the enthusiasm for collecting waning, but what I see is a decline in, I see it as a decline in people's willingness to pay top dollar or what people are asking for, uh, for some of these games. Now, I have said it before on my channel, I have long been an advocate of the idea that something is only worth what someone else is willing to pay for it. And from my, from my perspective, I'm not willing to pay some of the top dollar prices that some folks are asking for certain games. Um, especially when you've got a game that is rare, but isn't very good. Uh, or something that is rare, but there are hundreds of repros on eBay. You know, I would rather bite the bullet and get a repro or do the flashcard thing for a game that might otherwise cost me, cost me $200 <clears throat> versus paying full price for something 
just because someone has arbitrarily set a price or a price that is is arbitrary because other people who have more money than cents um, are willing to pay high prices for things uh, just because uh, the perceived value is what it is. <clears throat> so even with that though, the, the pessimist in me says that prices won't continue to fall or that it'll cap out pretty quickly and that we may never see a sub $20 Contra NES cartridge again outside of the rare garage sale, um, thrift store find. Your buddy sells it to you and makes you a good deal because he knows that the spare copy of the game that he bought 12 years ago for $5 isn't actually worth any more now than when he bought bought it for five dollars it's just that the price has gone up in online markets and that up next is Casper <clears throat> uh, so outside of those kinds of scenarios you know good guy deals so to speak uh, I think part of me believes that we're not gonna see prices fall too much on common games just because there's a there's a floor at which the business model for game stores and online retailers and so forth to continue to sell these items it's no longer worth doing or those who are dedicated to selling mostly games are gonna have to diversify their business models and most of the businesses that I see selling these things are already diversified and are doing more. I mean, just thinking about some of the game stores in the area where I live, you know, there, there's a there's a small uh, chain of game stores that they sell video games, but then they also sell DVDs and Blu-rays, and um, and they go for everything retro and modern. Uh, there's another game store that I like to go to that uh, also deals in comic books and nostalgia based stuff like they sell posters uh, with classic G.I. Joe and Transformers and, and replica movie posters from from 80s movies and 90s movies and things like that. So you can go in and, and buy a copy of Aladdin for the Sega Genesis and then also walk out of there with a replica Aladdin movie poster or um, or a, a Super Mario Brothers uh, t-shirt or something like that and so a lot of these places they're already diversifying you know the, one of the other places that I go to in addition to doing uh, DVDs and Blu-rays as part of their business. They also sell uh, used iPhones, iPads, smartphones, tablets, computers. They fix computers uh, and you know they occasionally will sell um, TVs, uh, LCDs and things like that. And so they, they do a lot of this stuff as a means of just helping to keep their options open because retro gaming as a business model may or may not be sustainable in the long term and I think that's the fear that a lot of people are have started to get out of the, the business <clears throat> or have shrunk their business just because there's not as much to go around there's less supply because more and more people who have got into the ha uh, into the hobby have already filled a lot of their quotas or or purchased the stuff that they wanted and so they're not as eager to go out there and spend lots of money on a lot of these games anymore next is Wario Land 2 <clears throat> um, so I guess in relation to that I would like to, to pose the question is do we think that the current trend being what it is of falling game prices 
is going to affect people's buying habits. Uh, <clears throat> do we think that the trend of people buying retro games and uh, or do we think that the trend of of retro game prices falling assuming that continues or assuming that those prices uh, continue to come down little by little do we think that that will spur the market and promote more purchases and then create a cyclical effect where uh, <laughs> more people start coming and buying these games again. And so game stores start raising the prices or eBay sellers start raising the prices just so they can uh, try and reap the benefits of these things. So as, as prices come down and more people start buying, they start raising the prices again, either because their supply is limited and so they have to uh, raise prices to make it worth their while to continue to hunt these things down and resell them, or that, um, or that they're just raising the prices so they can make a couple extra bucks on each one of these sales. Um, uh, again, the optimist in me would say, I hope not. You know, I hope the the fall in prices is a good thing because we are seeing that many of the people who wanted some of these games are they already have the ones that they want and that at least for the common games that a lot of those games will come down in price just because nobody wants them anymore or very few people want them and so if the demand if the demand isn't there regardless of what the supply level looks like what i'm hoping is that the demand is low enough for many of these things that we don't have to worry about the supply because the demand is low enough that the supply number becomes irrelevant or immaterial simply because not enough people care or want a common game of one stripe or another to make it worth the time or effort for uh, game stores, eBay sellers, speculators, etc. to price those things arbitrarily and bring those prices down just so that they can continue to move units for people who see a game and may or may not be a hardcore collector but see it cheap enough that yeah I can take a chance on this Super Nintendo game at five dollars versus fifteen dollars you know that's that's an easy sell when you walk into a store and you see a game that's fifteen dollars unless you have more money than you know what to do with or as I said before more money than cents you should think twice before spending fifteen dollars on something that you may or may not ever play, or that may or may not be um, something that you enjoy. Last is Kirby's Block Ball. <clears throat> uh, and so, all of this to say that I think I, I like what I'm seeing in terms of the falling prices and the, the change in the market that we're seeing over the last few months. And certainly um, what appears to be a growing trend of prices for these things coming down. Now I know that that is potentially detrimental to people who have begun to use retro gaming as a business model or a way to kind of build their own small business on the side <clears throat> and I, I certainly don't want to draw the ire of those individuals but at the same time I think it needs to be understood that there's only so much you can milk out of a business model like that <clears throat> and there's only there are only so many customers 
in a niche market like this, and once most of those customers have what they want, the likelihood that they're going to continue to spend ridiculous amounts of money for stuff that they may or may not ever utilize and may just end up sitting on their shelf, it becomes a game of diminishing returns. So I think game stores and eBay sellers and speculators all need to recognize the fact that we're not all going to want to be party to the arbitrary price uh, nature of some of these things anymore just because the internet has made all of us I think smarter and savvier about how to do this stuff you know I go to a game store now when I walk in and I see an item that I think I might want and I look at the price and I go hmm that looks like it might be inflated to me and then I jump online and I go to price charting or something like that and I go on eBay and I search for sold listings you know I'll look at, at what current listings are and that might be you know a good way to see oh well this is how people are pricing this but that doesn't necessarily reflect what the actual <clears throat> going rate is uh, so, you know, if I walk in and I see a game that's listed for $20, I'm going to look at that and go, okay, is this a common game or not? Is this a sought-after game or not? What is, the, what is the going rate for this game based on stuff like price charting or I know there are a couple of other sites. Um, you know, what's it going for on Amazon? How many, how many of these have sold on eBay over the last six months or a year and uh, you know what is the actual demand for this game is the $20 price tag justified because it's a good game or because it's something that brings something unique to the table or does something interesting that you may not be able to find somewhere else or is it just $20 because that's what people have been willing to pay in the past so we're setting it at $20 because that's the market trend and we're doing that arbitrarily and other factors don't matter as much. But I think it all factors in and I think you have to look at these things from a more holistic perspective and then decide for yourself what you're going to pay and what your threshold is. Uh, <clears throat> and I think if people are more wary of anything over 10 or 15 dollars for a used game especially an incomplete game you know when you go somewhere and you see a loose cart and it's priced at 20 or 25 dollars my advice would be always check the price for something even if you have plenty of money you're not financially hurting in any way whatsoever I would still say check the prices don't just buy something because you have the money and you think it looks good be informed as a consumer I think that advice in and of itself is enough to help all of us make smarter and more informed and better purchasing decisions for our retro game collections and game collections in general uh, but I think on I think on the whole we also can apply that to uh, a lot of other things you know certainly I have become a lot more picky about things now that I have this room full of stuff you know I, I have less space now than two years ago um, because I've filled a lot of that space so I have to be a little bit more um, a little bit more cognizant of what it is that I'm buying and and when and how much I'm paying and all of that so I think if if we can be smarter about these things and smarter about these purchases and and we bring the demand down 
because we're not willing to pay $12 for what we may otherwise perceive as a $5 game, then I think we can make a difference in helping to continue this trend line and continue to bring these prices down and show that the, that the demand for some of these things isn't there the way that it used to be so that we can help to drive the market in a way that works to everyone's benefit. Um, it works to our benefit because it makes the prices lower. It works in for the benefit of game stores uh, from the sense that you know some of these common games they might have 12 copies sitting in their back room and one copy out on the shelf and they can't sell it because they they've priced it too high but when they start to price these things lower those of us who may otherwise not purchase a game that we don't need or don't uh, would never play might pick it up just to put in the collection you know I'm not a sports game guy but if I saw a decent NES sports game or Super NES sports game or Genesis sports game for a low price I'll pick it up you know over over on my uh, my Genesis collection I've got NHL 94 NHL 96 and I've got uh, uh, what is it <clears throat> NBA Live 96 I've got uh, Bulls versus Lakers or Bulls versus Blazers I think uh, yeah, Bulls versus Lakers in the NBA playoffs, and a couple of other things that I've picked up complete in box from Goodwill for five, six bucks. Not because I'll ever play them, but because they're complete Genesis games that I can use for my collection, uh, and you know they're really good deals. I mean, sports games aren't worth that much now, but. <clears throat> five or six dollars for a complete game that's in good condition yeah I'll take that and so when you start to see these prices come down uh, you know I think it's a lot easier for someone to swallow three to five dollars for a common game that may, they may or may not be interested in but might otherwise purchase for their collection just to have it or they may purchase it because they're they've got a couple of rare titles or a couple of more expensive titles that they haven't been able to move but they know they might be able to move it faster if they sell, sell it in a lot. And so if they can pad that lot with a handful of, of less expensive uh, common games, they may be more inclined to purchase something at $3 or $5 just to pad out a, a listing or a lot on Craigslist or eBay and put it back out there. So I think, I think the trend can and should continue and I think it will continue if those of us who are in the hobby continue to be smart about our purchases and not spending money that we don't have on games or not paying too much for games just because they're arbitrarily priced in such a way um, and so I guess that's really what I wanted to say about this topic and um, you know kind of put my thoughts out there but what do you think? Uh, I'd like to hear from all of you in terms of, you know, what what all of you think about game collecting and where prices are at and what the trending looks like. And, uh, you know, do you see this trend continuing? If so, why? And if not, why not? Um, you know, what what games or game systems would you like to see come down in price? Or would you like to see be easier to collect for. Uh, obviously NES is a, a big one. That's the one that everybody talks about. But there are other uh, there are other collections now that since NES collecting has uh, plateaued in a lot of ways or a lot of the folks who are into the NES are either getting out of it or starting to slow down. You know what what other kinds of games or or consoles do you foresee potentially shifting in price either trending upward or downward and uh, you know what do you see as factors in that I'd love to hear from you guys in the comment section below uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Game Boy Guru I'll have a link in the description below to my blog where you can read my Game Boy reviews that is GameboyGuru.blogspot.com 
Also make sure you check out Nira and his channel. He has a great channel full of game music and uh, uh, chiptune covers, and he's provided the Super Mario Land Overworld theme that I use as the intro to many of my videos, so make sure you go check out his channel as well. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for playing, and game on.